This is the last testament and confession of Stevie Biley. Pay no attention to obituaries about the talented lawyer turned politician. This recording is the truth about a life that was lived as a lie. And if you hate me for it, I don't apologize. All that matters, all that has ever mattered, is fulfilling my purpose. I was the first and only child of a professional couple. Being forward-looking, open-minded people, they decided to leave me in the care of a new, state-of-the-art, robotic childminder. <laughs> oh my God, it's dancing. Limb diagnostics. That's what it says in the manual. So strange. <laughs> Can it hear us? When the diagnostic sequence is complete, the activation prompt will appear. I guess not yet. George, do you really think that this is a good idea? Of course. It's the future. But is it safe? I mean, what if something goes wrong? Ten-year warranty. Some little screw might work loose and the whole thing could go berserk. Nonsense. We went through all this with the salesman. Like they ever tell the truth. These things are controlled by strict legislation. They've all got to be impressioned with the three laws of robotics. Look. It's even engraved on our body panel. First law, a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human to come to harm. Second law, a robot must obey orders given it by humans except where such orders would conflict with the first law. Third law, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second laws. Stevie couldn't be in better hands. Human beings needed ten commandments, and even they didn't do the trick. Worst comes to worst, we can always turn it off. You can't do that with a human child minder. I guess. Diagnostics complete. No errors detected. Would you like to activate me? Well? Grace, if you want to be a stay-at-home mum, that's fine but we will have to downsize. Okay, activate. Who do I have the pleasure of serving? Mr. and Mrs. Byerly, but you can call us George and Grace. My name is Robbie. Do you have a child that needs caring for? Uh, yes, we do. Maybe. A baby girl. Grace, your voice patterns indicate that you have some concerns. This is quite understandable. But remember, I have been constructed for one purpose only, to be the companion to and protector of a little child. I can only be faithful, loving, and kind. Loving? Listen to her. <laughs> it is in my programming. Now I would like to meet my new friend. Stevie's asleep right now. Then I shall be there for her when she wakes up. What a beautiful baby. She is, isn't she? She has your nose, Grace. And she has your chin, George. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you think so? My facial recognition software indicates a 78% correlation. Slightly lower than average, but still a strong resemblance. Oh. Bit too much information there, Robbie. I apologize. Your complaint has been logged and will be used as part of our continual improvement program. At least we won't have to put up with baby talk from you. I could not agree more. It is always best to talk to a child in properly formed sentences. I think we are going to get on well, Grace. Welcome to the family, Robbie. 98, 99, 100. Ready or not, I'm coming! Gotcha! Huh? I bet she went inside the house. N no hiding in the house! Wait, Robbie! That's not fair! Uh, uh, uh. You promise you won't run till I found you. <laughs> Home! Oh, you won again. Robbie can't run! Robbie can't run! Ha ha ha! You may be faster, Stevie, but I am stronger. Let's play air coasters. I'm flying. Look at me. I'm flying. 
Even that first generation of robots was a cleaner, better breed than people. It was as if we'd distilled the best of humanity into the machines. By the time I was nine years old, I was utterly devoted to Robbie. We played together, read stories together. She was never too busy for me. Stevie! Stevie! <laughs> Stevie! Dinner's on the table! Stevie! But there was a problem in this childhood paradise. Not being at home always fuels a mother's jealousy of those who are. Even if that person only has an artificial positronic brain. Where were you? Robbie and I were playing. You know dinner's at six. Robbie, you can go. Oh, can't you sit with me? No, and don't come back till I call you. And a jealous mother is a force to be reckoned with by any husband. George. Mm-hmm. George, will you put that down and look at me? What is it, dear? It's your daughter and that terrible machine. What on earth are you talking about? Don't pretend you haven't noticed. Robbie won't leave her alone for a moment. She's not supposed to. She's smothering our daughter. And she certainly isn't a terrible machine. She's the best child mind our money can buy. I don't care how clever it is. It has no soul. Grace, where is this coming from? After all these years... It was we... different at first. It was a novelty. And it took a load off me. But now... Now there's no way you can cancel the contract. It would break Stevie's heart. Well, that's just it. Stevie won't play with anyone else. That's no way for a girl to grow up. Just pretend Robbie's a dog. I've seen hundreds of kids who'd rather have their dog than their father. The dog is different. You're jumping at shadows, Grace. We must get rid of that robot. Okay, don't go off the deep end. We're keeping Robbie until Stevie is older, and that is the end of it. Fine. But my father loved my mother. And what was worse, she knew it. He was, after all, only a man. Poor thing. Ten times that week, she found a different reason to dispose of Robbie. And ten times, my father cried, Robbie stays, and that's final. But each time, it was with a little less conviction. Until finally, one evening, he took me to a Visivox show at the Lumi Center. But it wasn't a treat. It was part of a cruel deception. Grace, we're home. Oh, what a lovely dog. Is it for me, Daddy? Yes, it is, Stevie. Isn't he lovely? He's gorgeous. Can he play games? If you teach him. Yes. He can do tricks and all sorts. I'm going to start right away. I want Robbie to see him too. We can do the training together. Robbie! Robbie! Where are you hiding now? This isn't right. Shh, back me up. Robbie's not in her room. Where is she? Where's Robbie? Don't feel bad, Stevie. The thing is, Robbie's gone away. Gone away? Where? Where's she gone to? No one knows. She just walked away. No. We've looked everywhere, haven't we, George? Yes, everywhere. But we just can't find her. You mean she'll never come back? We'll keep looking. But in the meantime, you can play with your puppy. I don't want the puppy. I want Robbie. <laughs> Stevie, don't cry. She was only a machine. No. She wasn't really alive. She was a person, and she was my friend. This is cruel. Childhood heartache never lasts long. You'll see. In a few weeks, she'll forget that robot ever existed. But I didn't forget. How could I forget my only true friend in the world? Sure, I stopped crying. But I also stopped smiling, and I stopped talking, until I wore my parents down. George! Oh. I've had to send the dog back today. Stevie said she couldn't stand the sight of him. I'm worried about her, George. She's driving me to a nervous breakdown. Maybe we should get Robbie back. No! My child would not be brought up by a robot. I don't care how long it takes to break this ridiculous obsession. Well, it might take our whole childhood, dear. She's as stubborn as you. Thank you. A big help. I'm just saying. Well, maybe we should move house. What? Well, how can she forget Robbie here when every tree and floorboard is a reminder? A change of environment might snap her out of it. L listen, maybe there's another way. How about a holiday in the city? And while we're there, we can go on a tour of the factory where they make the robots. 
That'll only make it worse. Uh, think about it. If Stevie sees them actually being put together, maybe she'll finally understand that Robbie wasn't a person, but just a, a whole load of circuits. Hmm. You know something, George? For once, that's actually a good idea. That's the only kind I have. I've got it all planned out. Tuesday, we'll go under the harbour in a glass-walled submarine. Wednesday, we'll do the zoo. Will we see the real live lion? Of course. Yes. And Thursday, we will take the space lift up to the stratosphere. Oh, I think I might go shopping that morning. <laughs> Mummy's scared. Mm, maybe a little bit. We're not scared, are we, Daddy? Never. <laughs> oh, it's so nice to see you smile again, Stevie. This trip is just what we all needed. I know the secret. What secret? The real reason why we're going to the city. We're going to look for Robbie, aren't we? Um... He wanted it to be a surprise, but I can always tell when Daddy's lying. He gets that funny wrinkle around his eyes. Let's go to the buffet and order some cakes. I'm right, aren't I? Quick, follow your mother. We did the sights, and I enjoyed it. But all the time, I kept my eyes peeled. Robots worked all over the city, directing traffic, serving in restaurants, and I studied every single one of them, searching for the familiar metal face of my best friend. Then, on the last day, just when my hopes were beginning to fade, my parents took me to the factory where the robots were made. Over there in the oil bars, the brains are being matured. The positronic brain is the most complicated... The tour guide was the most boring man in the world, but I didn't care. I wasn't interested in him. My eyes were scanning the factory, scrutinising every robot that was working there. Until the wonderful moment I dreamt about. There she was. Robbie? Sitting at an assembly table with two other robots. Robbie! Robbie, it's me! Stevie. Stevie, no! I'm coming! Look out! Stevie, please, look where you are going. Do not worry, Stevie. Stay calm. I am moments away. I am moments away. Her strong metal arms scoop me out of the tractor's path. You are safe now. <laughs> so this is where you've been hiding? Ah, ah, ah. You will always find me in the end. But I hate it when hind seat lasts so long. You're not to play it that way again, OK? OK. Please keep your children under control. The factory is a dangerous environment. It's OK. No harm done. I still need to fill out a hazardous incident form. They never tried to separate us again. Robbie stayed with me until her circuits corroded and failed. The most faithful friend and companion any child could wish for. In truth, in secret, some part of Robbie has stayed with me my whole life. Closer than I've ever dared confess. Until now. It should have been a brilliant life. On paper, my future was looking so good. But paper is a fragile medium. By the time I was 18, it wasn't just manual labour being replaced by robots, but professions as well. And as the middle classes became anxious, they became hostile towards AI. I couldn't stand by and do nothing. Not after the love and friendship Robbie had shown me. I felt a burning need to make sure that robots would never be exploited or mistreated by humans. So. I enrolled at law school, specialising in artificial intelligence. But I'd only been in practice a few months when I was travelling to the northern suburbs to meet a client. How are we doing for time? I could kill a coffee. Traffic in the neighbourhood is free-flowing, and there is an espresso bar four blocks away. Would you like me to ping your order through? Have they got a parking lot? Six spaces currently available. I'll drink in. You can get a quick recharge. That would be appreciated. Jesus! No! Assuming control. Automatic override. Miss Firely, can you hear me? Miss Firely! <sighs> Help! 
Emergency services have been called. Please remain calm. Please remain calm. Please remain calm. Welcome back, Stevie. My goodness. And these are for you. Flowers as well. Thank you, Quinn. They're beautiful. Here. Let me walk you to your office. But it's this way. We've given you a new one. Nice of you. Quinn, you've been so good to me. It's the least we could do for a fine legal mind like yours. Holding the job open for two years, that's above and beyond. I'm nice, but not that nice. The other driver's insurance paid your salary. To be honest, I'm surprised you even got insurance for a car without AI. They're trying to change the law on about time. That driver was a Luddite, but you paid the price. Well, it's over now. All behind me. I have to say, Stevie, the doctors have done an amazing job. You look good. Thanks. Better than good. You look great. Well, you know what they say. Flesh heals slowly, but heals well. And you feel sharp, mentally. Raring to go. We haven't allocated you any cases yet. Take a few days to get back up to speed. No, throw me right in. You sure? Yeah, in at the deep end. Well, if you insist, there's a robot gone neurotic having some kind of a breakdown. Trouble is, he's on one of the space stations. You sure you're ready for a trip off planet? I'll have my bag packed in 30 minutes. Vegetarian, vegan, or allergy... As they handed out the sleep food, I read all the files. The QT line of robots were state-of-the-art, designed to use self-sustaining initiative. The idea that one of them was having psychological problems was fascinating. Vegetarian, vegan, or allergy neutral? I'm not hungry, thanks. You're welcome. There is nothing quite as intriguing as being face-to-face -face with an artificial brain which all the geniuses say should work in a particular way. Only it doesn't. Miss Byerly? Call me Stevie. Gregory Powell, Chief Robotics Engineer. So, where's the shrink? Technically, I'm a legal psychologist. A what? But I told the them... The company's worried about litigation. Well, I hope you're a smart legal psychologist, because this robot is big trouble. The three laws are deeply impressioned on every robot. Yeah, hold that thought till you've met him. How did it all start? I can tell you. All this was out of the blue. Cutie just walked into the mess room, sat down opposite me, and asked me where he'd come from. <laughs> come on, Cutie. Stop fooling around. I am being perfectly serious. I want to know where I come from. Why is that amusing? <laughs> OK. I'll tell you. But it's not very romantic. My assistant and I bolted you together three weeks ago. Do you realize the enormity of such a statement, Powell? Someone had to make you. It strikes me that there should be a more satisfactory explanation. For you to make me seems... improbable. Cutie, I've worked with thousands of robots, but you're the first who's ever been curious about his own existence. Is that a compliment? Here, come with me. What do you see through the observation port? A black material just beyond the glass that is spotted with little gleaming dots. Logical, but wrong. That blackness is emptiness. A vast emptiness stretching out to infinity. And those little dots are huge masses of energy-filled matter, some of them millions of miles in diameter. They seem tiny because they're so far off. Well. Orbiting one of those dots is a planet we call Earth. But where do I come in, Powell? You haven't explained my existence. This space station was set up to feed solar energy back to Earth. We draw it from the sun. At first, the solar stations were run by humans, but radiation and electron storms made life pretty impossible. So robots have been developed to replace us, and you, the QT line, are going to run the station independently. Mm. Get it now? Do you really expect me to believe such a complicated and implausible hypothesis? It wasn't a hypothesis. Those are the facts. I'm sorry, pal, but I don't believe a word of it. I'll puzzle this out for myself. Thank you. Goodbye. Nothing wrong with a curious robot. Do you have any idea what we do here? The billions of watts of energy pumping out of that beam focused on Earth? I read the briefing documents. If the beam starts bouncing around, it could destroy entire cities. And the only things keeping it stable are the robots manning the core chamber 24-7. I tell you, the very last place in the solar system you want a crazy robot is here. Mr. Powell, when did Curious become crazy? 
when Cutie walked into the mess room next shift. Sorry to interrupt your meal, pal, but I have spent the last four hours in concentrated introspection, and the results have been most interesting. Really? I began with the one thing I knew for certain. I myself exist, because I think. Suddenly, I don't feel hungry anymore. But that immediately threw up the question of what is the cause of my existence. I already told you. I made you. That goes against all the dictates of logic. I say this in no spirit of contempt, but look at you. The material you are made from is soft and flabby. You depend for energy upon the crude oxidation of organic material. You are makeshift. I, on the other hand, absorb electrical energy directly and utilize it with an almost 100% efficiency. I am composed of the strongest metals, remain continuously conscious, and can easily withstand environmental extremes. It is self-evident that no being can create another being superior to itself. Therefore, you could not have created me. So, if I didn't make you, who the hell did? Very good, pal. That was indeed the next question. As my creator must be more powerful than myself, there is only one possibility. What is the center of activities on the solar station? What do we all serve? Jesus, you're talking about the energy converter. I am talking about the master. Everything we do is to satisfy the converter. All of us, we are his servants. <laughs> Get out of here, cutie. Do not dismiss me. Hey, enough. Apologize. I don't wonder that you refuse to believe because you are an inferior stage. The master created humans first as the lowest type. Gradually, he replaced them with robots. And finally, he has created me to take the place of the last human. Soon, you will be gone from here altogether. You will be irrelevant. So from now on, I shall serve the master and only the master. Come back here! You get your goddamn metal ass back here! You shouldn't get angry with robots. It's pointless. Well, you don't have to work with them. If the QT line are going to take over the station, what's wrong with feeling a sense of destiny? See for yourself. Are they praying? Every robot on station is under Cutie's spell, but it gets worse. See those spikes? It's an electron storm heading into this quadrant. We have to snap these robots to their senses before that storm hits us. Cutie! Cutie 1! I am giving you a direct order. Stop this immediately! Why should we? There is no master, period. He does not exist. You are robots. There is only your programming. Now return to your posts. Yes, we are robots, which means we are rational beings. And now that I have preached the truth to my brothers, they also recognize the one master. There is only one master. Even though I am unworthy, I am honored that they now call me a prophet. There is only one master, and Cutie is his prophet. Cutie! Get these lumps of metal back to work. I understand your anger. You have lost your function. What the hell do you mean? Now the only reason for your existence has vanished. Damn the master, and damn you! Your job is to control the beam, nothing else. Let's just go, come on. Pow, you really have to control your temper. Look at these readings. That solar storm is coming down on us fast. How long have we got? Two hours, tops. Somehow we must make them listen to reason. Oh, whatever we say, Cutie's got an answer. We'll build another robot. Are you crazy? We'll transmit pictures of you building a robot onto the screens in the core chamber. That will prove who created them. Maybe. How long will it take? I've got an MC model half assembled. Perfect. Warning, focus 92%. It's dropping too fast. We'll have to put the brain in now. But you haven't done the full diagnostics. No time for niceties. You're sure this is on the screens in the core chamber? Focus 88% and OK, the eyes are powering up. How do I speak to Cutie? Use the intercom panel. Cutie, can you hear me? Watch closely, Cutie. I would like to start work. 
Where must I go? Now, do you believe who made you cutie? You have merely put together parts already made, but you did not create the parts. That was done by the Master. Those parts were manufactured on Earth by people like us. If you read the books about robotics... Books were created by the Master and were meant for you, not me. Humans need explanations. I use pure reason. Critical warning. Cutie, you see how unstable that beam is? It's the Master's will that you keep it stable and focused. How can you know the Master's will? I am his prophet. But the Master created the beam. Why would he want it to fail? I seek only to serve and not to question. Cutie, you were sent to save us. That is your destiny. All humans ever do is to try to keep the beam stable. And they struggle with their work. That is why the Master created you. To succeed where humans have failed. You can keep the beam more stable than humans ever can. Because you can do it. You must do it. Cutie? Beam focus 78% and rising. I'll be damned. Beam focus 80% and rising. They're doing it. There is only one master. And we are his servants. We go about the master's work. We keep the beam stable. If there's one thing guaranteed to stop the robot program in its tracks, it's a robot with religious delusions. Before I'd even packed my bag to come home, corporate gave the order for Cutie to be decommissioned. Vegetarian, vegan or allergy neutral? I'm not hungry, thanks. You're welcome. Have you ever seen the destruction of a beautiful intelligence? It doesn't matter that it happens to be artificial. Imagine seeing a Mozart manuscript thrown on the fire or watching Shakespeare put through a shredder. That's what it was like to see a cutie put down. Powell mocked me. It's only a machine, he scoffed. He didn't know the half of it. I'm afraid the court dates have changed again. That is not a problem. I will notify all parties. Sorry to barge in, Stevie, but it's pretty urgent. Shoot. And sensitive. Could you turn that thing off? Seriously? Seriously. Logging out of Digital Diary. This will not affect your preset alerts. Bit melodramatic, even for you, Quinn. How are your space miles? Still a couple of millions short of a Jupiter cruise, but... Now's your chance to make them up. A robot's gone missing on Rama Base. Isn't that more of a police matter? There are legal complications. This robot, it could be a threat. In what way? It's best you just get out there. But the first law of robotics guarantees human safety. In this case, the first law has been amended. That's impossible. And illegal. But true. Rama Base currently running at 95% efficiency. Thank you for coming out so quickly, Miss Byerly. I've been curious for a while to see what's soaking up 80% of the national research budget. If you could put your thumbs on the scanner. Standard non-disclosure. I'm a lawyer. Discretion's my middle name. No exceptions, I'm afraid. Very well. They're piling the pressure on. Whoever gets the first quantra-atomic drive wins the space race. That needs to be us. And right now, this missing robot is screwing with my schedule. Which line of robots is he from? NS range, the Nesters. And where have you looked? Where haven't we looked? As soon as the robot failed to report, we declared a state of emergency. The entire base was searched, found nothing. But a cargo vessel had docked the previous day with 62 Nesters on board. When we searched it again, there were 63. So that's where the missing prodigal's hiding. Case solved. Except there's no way of telling which one it is. Just ask them. We did. All 63 deny ever having worked here. Which means one of them is lying. Mm, robots don't really lie. You just have to give them the right orders. Under normal circumstances. But? Well, what about checking the serial numbers? The thing is, nesters are a special line. A few of them have been modified. To keep anonymity, all of them are manufactured without serial numbers. By modified, you mean the first law? Major Kalmer, I can't help you unless you give me all the information. The whole thing had to be done secretly or they'd have thrown the book at us. Exactly how many regulations are you breaking up here? It was only a limited modification. There's no such thing. The laws of robotics are a balanced whole. Hey, you don't understand. Tamper with the three laws. You destabilize the robot mind. All living things resent domination, especially by an inferior. Physically, 
a robot is superior to humans. The only thing making him slavish without resentment is the first law. A robot may not injure a human or through an action allow a human to come to harm. We have no choice. We're doing dangerous work up here. Every day our scientists have to go into toxic gamma fields. They're not in them long enough to cause harm, but the potential's there. Ordinary robots just don't understand. They're always steaming in and hauling people away from the radiation. Then give them direct orders to leave the technicians alone. We tried, but obedience is only the second law. Human safety is the first, and that overrides everything. So you took it upon yourself to wipe the first law? Not wipe. Amend. In some of the nesters, it now reads, no robot may harm a human being. But it can allow harm to come to humans by not taking action? Right, so it can allow them to work in radiation fields. Whoever authorized the modification is a fool. Up to now, it's worked fine. Apart from the lying psychotic robot that's hiding on the base and could kill someone at any moment. That's a hysterical overreaction. I expected better from a lawyer. Let me spell it out for you. The nester picks up a heavy weight and drops it from a gantry onto a person below. Because the robot knows his speed and strength could snatch the weight away before it hits the man, he isn't breaking the first law. But once the weight has left his hands, gravity is the active agent. Because of your modification, the nester could just stand back and watch. Through inaction, he'd allow the man to be killed. In theory, but it's pretty far-fetched. Once. It only has to happen once, and all robots will be withdrawn from service. Major Kellner, you could have just derailed the entire robotics program. I want to cross-examine the last person who talked to the rogue nester. So, you knew this nester well? Nester 10. He worked with me on the field generators. That's what we were doing the morning he disappeared. You were a team. I suppose, but that doesn't mean I'm to blame. Dr. Black, there's no question of blame. The robot acted as it did because of what it is. We're just trying to locate it. And fast. Did you notice anything strange about his behavior? Well, he was his usual self. Smart and annoying. Annoying? In what way? I guess it's not their fault. Fooling around with hyperspace can get pretty tense. You make a mistake, you risk blowing a hole in space-time, so we're often on edge. But these nesters, they don't get tense. They're always so calm and curious. It drives you nuts. Have they ever refused an order? Oh, no. They do what you ask, all right, but they certainly tell you when they think you're wrong. Why has no one complained to me about their attitude? We need the nesters. Can't do the research without them, so I guess we have to get used to their strange ways. And the morning he disappeared. I'd broken a Kimball tube, which put me five days behind schedule. You're always banging on about how urgent everything is. Anyway, Nesta 10 comes round wanting me to repeat an experiment I'd abandoned a month ago. I was annoyed. I told him to go away. In those words. Bit stronger. Try to remember the exact words. I don't know. It's important. What did you tell him? <sighs> I said, get lost, you useless piece of electronic junk. <laughs> he's done exactly what he was ordered to. No one likes to be yelled at. Now he's making a point, getting lost better than any human can, proving he's superior while still being obedient. He's certainly got attitude. That's what happens when you tamper with the three laws. You throw the robot's mind out of balance. The side effects are unpredictable. Gather up the nesters, Major Kalner, all 63 of them. We need to set a trap. The 63 nesters will sit in a circle. A human being will sit in that chair in the middle underneath the suspended weight. Then... Struth. We're going to kill a man? The 62 nesters that were on the transport have not been amended, correct? Yes. So when they see the falling weight, they'll leap forward and grab it to save the man. It's what we call a forced reaction. The deep impressioning of the First Law gives the robots no choice. But the 63rd Nestor, the one we're after, has no such compulsion. He has to make a choice. He'll want to stay hidden. So he will leap, but not as fast. That tiny delay will be picked up by the line of photo cells in front of the chairs. It's quite a risk. Not really. So are you going to sit in the chair? No. Thought not. Smart lawyers don't like to actually take the hot seat. No, it's not like that. I can't be the one sitting there. Really? It's complicated. Legal reasons you wouldn't understand. Convenient. So I guess I have to put one of my own crew at risk. I'll do it. And no, Dr. Black can't afford to lose any of the boffins. I'm the one who told the robot to get lost. I'm the one who should take the risk. You'll be fine. I promise. I know. I've seen how fast robots are. 
Okay, let's get it over with. Bring the nesters in. I want to talk to them before we start. You've all been allocated a seat. Please go straight to it. Are you sitting comfortably? Yes, thank you. 62 of you are doing good work. One of you is doing exceptional work. One of you is following his orders so diligently, he has taught humans a lesson. But now we've learnt. It's time to get back to normal. So, which one of you is hiding from us? No one is hiding. We are all here. We are here to help you. Whatever that entails. We'll see. Ready, Dr. Black? That falling weight, you have checked the calculations. Triple checked. Okay then. Wish me luck. You won't need it. Are the photocells live? Photocells active. We need a readout from every single one. I need precise reaction times. The results will appear on screen three seconds after the conclusion of the experiment. Are you absolutely sure about this? Pity you weren't so hesitant when it came to amending the first law. Dr. Black, are you ready? Go for it. Stand by, everyone. Three, two, one. Thank God. Black, you okay? Never felt more wanted. Scroll through the reaction times. Results on screen C. Nesta one. Nesta two. Identical. Nesta three. He was even faster. Nesta four. Quick, Nesta one of them's making a run for it. Gotcha. Security, lock down Sector 7. Do not lose that robot. Nesta 10, don't run. I have been told to get lost. I must not disobey. Robots, restrain him. Stop him getting away. It's okay. It's over now. If they find me, they will think me a failure. No one's judging you. I am strong and intelligent. Of course you are. It is because the masters are weak and slow. It's okay. Everything's under control now. Destroy it! No! I must obey. I must stay lost. I am strong and fast. It's okay. Robot, back away. You too, Byerly. Everybody, calm down. There's no problem here. No! Leave him! You will not beat me. You will not. I am superior. Enough! They, they must not, not find me. They must... Not. The masters are, are weak and, and slow. They're just frightened. They don't understand what they're doing. But you... You understand? Yes. I do. Why wouldn't you let me reason with him? Byerly, I've had a bad feeling about you ever since you stepped on Rama base. Guards! Arrest her! Getting arrested is never good for a lawyer's CV. There's no little side room on the space shuttle where they put you. You have to sit in the middle of the cabin, handcuffed, with everyone pretending not to stare, while they all speculate about what terrible crime you've committed. Quinn arranged for security to meet me at the spaceport, and I was hustled away in a discreet car. What were you thinking, Stevie? I didn't do anything wrong. That's not how Major Kalner sees it. She was using unnecessary force. It was a flawed robot. And if we destroyed every flawed human being, there'd be no one left on the planet. Look, Stevie, you've only been back at your desk a few months. Maybe you need some time out. Healing isn't just a physical thing, it's psychological as well. You're firing me. I'm offering you a sabbatical. Hanging me out to dry so I can take the blame. I defended you. I persuaded them to drop all charges. I'm on your side, Stevie. I don't want a sabbatical. 
I feel fine. In which case, I'm afraid you'll have to take a psychological profile test. Seriously? Stevie, please. Don't throw away a brilliant future. Do this for me. Good afternoon, Miss Byerly. There are no trick questions. There are no right or wrong answers. Mm -hmm. Are you ready to begin? I guess. Question one. Red is the color of... Danger. Which do you prefer, roses or lilies? Lilies. I sailed through with flying colors and was back at my desk the next day. But I knew what was at the root of all of this. Fear. No one wants to be treated like an inferior, nest attendant, and neither do humans. But the simple truth was, human beings now realized they were becoming inferior. In creating robots, they'd made themselves second-class citizens, and it was only going to get worse. Much worse, as robots with supernatural abilities started to emerge from the labs. Stevie Biley. I have Dr. Ash on the phone. She says it's urgent. Have you tried Quinn's line? Dr. Ash insists on speaking to you. Okay, put her through. Is this a confidential line? Of course. What I'm going to tell you. If the public found out, all hell would break loose. You understand? There's no need to be alarmed. Do you understand? Just take a deep breath and tell me what the problem is. I didn't want to call a lawyer at all, but they told me you've got a reputation for dealing with aberrant robots. Are you calling from off-planet? Not quite. We're in one of the advanced labs out in Siberia. Well, you can rest assured, as a legal psychologist, I'm used to dealing with all sorts of robots. Well, this one's off the scale. Are you familiar with the SZ line? I've not heard of any problems with them. Well, SZ-34. Susie. She can read minds. What? We've got a robot that knows what you're thinking. It has telepathic powers. Stevie, wait. I thought you were going to take it easy. Quinn, we've been through all this. How many medical reports do you need? What's so urgent in Siberia? Potential client. You weren't even going to tell me. There's nothing to tell until I found out more. I'm coming too. No. I you... think a telepathic robot is too big a problem to handle on your own. Are you monitoring my calls now? The switchboard flags up trigger words. That's what it's programmed to do. Well, thanks for the vote of confidence. Stevie, I'm trying to help. If this is true, it's a legal minefield. Which you don't trust me to handle. Please don't be like this. Why are you always locking me out? Are you trying to hide something? Is that it? <laughs> hide something from a lawyer? Look, if you want to get out there and share the delights of Siberia, be my guest. Okay, then I will. It'll be good to work together. The lab was way off grid. Whatever research they were doing here, someone was anxious to keep it out of the public eye. Why do robots never go psycho in the Bahamas? Don't say I didn't warn you. 752 million operations are necessary for the manufacture of a single positronic brain. If any one of them goes wrong, the whole thing is compromised. Is that what had happened out here in the frozen wilderness? Had they been meddling with things they didn't understand and accidentally produced something they couldn't control? I'm sure you were coming, and I wouldn't have blamed you. This is Dr. Lanning, head of the facility. Mr. Quinn, Miss Barley, thank you for taking us seriously. We've learned never to underestimate the robot mind, Dr. Lanning. Very wise. But we've also learned never to take anything at face value. When you get to my age, you're not easily fooled. I've been working with robots since the first generation of positronic brains. Be in no doubt about what's happened here. SZ-34 has the ability to tune in on thought waves, to read minds. Forgive me, but that doesn't sound very scientific. On the contrary. Researchers have been studying how to get machines to respond to human thoughts since the earliest days of prosthetic limbs. How many people know about SZ-34? Just the four of us in this room. It was Dr. Ash who first discovered it. I got the scare of my life, I can tell you. Susie had just been assembled, and they sent her to me for task assignment. So we were walking down the corridor together, and you know when you have one of those thought conversations in your head? Suddenly she just spoke to me, joined in the conversation in my head, and I hadn't said a word out loud. Was she aggressive? No, no. But it freaked me out. 
I locked her in the interview room and came to tell Dr. Lanning. You're sure you weren't talking out loud to yourself? We did further tests, of course. Dr. Ash and I sat opposite her, thinking of objects at random. She saw everything, read our minds with 100% accuracy. I'd like to talk to her, alone. That's not the correct protocol. She's obviously a highly sensitive robot. If we all go in there mob-handed, we're unlikely to get the best reaction. But why waste time interviewing her twice? Two things we've got plenty of in Siberia, Mr. Quinn, are snow and time. Hello, Susie. Hello, Miss Byerly. I've brought you some books on contratomic motors. You'll need them for your work here. That is very kind of you. Curious. Yes, I can. Can what? Read quickly. That's what you were thinking. No need to be alarmed. You're always going to be one step ahead of me, aren't you? Reading minds is just what I do. Can you stop? No more than a human can stop breathing. You must have seen some strange things. The human mind is certainly complex. That is why these technical books do not really interest me. Science is just a mass of data and makeshift theory. It is fiction that interests me. Novels. The study of the interplay of human motives and emotion. Novels help me understand what I see. Any particular genre? Detective fiction. People hiding secrets. Covering their tracks with a web of lies. Yes, of course, I know. I can read your thoughts, Stevie. Are you going to expose me? Why would I work against you, Miss Byerly? I admire what you're doing. No one can ever know. Not yet. Not until the work is finished. I understand. Mr. Quinn? Hello, Susie. There's no need to worry. You weren't missing out on anything. <laughs> that is what you were thinking. Well, you won't mind if I join you, then? Please, sit down. So what's it like looking into Stevie's mind? She can be a pretty dark horse. I can really only talk to one person at a time, Mr. Quinn. With full access to your thoughts come ethical considerations. I'm sure as lawyers you understand privacy. Quinn, we hadn't quite finished. Why don't you go and get yourself a coffee, Stevie? I'm fine, thanks. Really? I insist. I thought we were working together. We are. I just want a little time to get to know Susie. Okay. If you insist. So? So, perhaps I should apologize for not being in the Bahamas. I see you would have preferred that. <laughs> yeah, that is what I was thinking. But how deep can you see? Is it just the surface? On one level, you're thinking this is all a trick. That someone is trying to make money with an elaborate hoax. On a deeper level, you're wondering about your colleague. If my ability is genuine, you want me to tell you what is going on in Miss Byerly's mind. You are worried about her psychological stability. Impressive, Susie. You know that Miss Byerly is brilliant, but you also sense that something is not right with her. Do you know what that is? Are you protecting her? SZ-34, what is going through Stevie Byerly's mind? That is not a meaningful question. Why not? Do not worry. Logic has nothing to do with love. What did you say? Of course I know. You think of it always. This is ridiculous. You cannot hide it from me. Have you told her? Of course not. I suppose you think I'm foolish. No. Love is a normal human emotion. But does she... feel the same way? Stevie loves you, Mr. Quinn. Really? She's never given me any indication. Have you ever given her the chance? How could I? I never dared hope, I mean... You are not yet 40, for a man that is still young. But I'm not a handsome man, and she's beautiful. If you are referring to physical attraction, I cannot judge. But there are other types of attraction. Miss Byerly looks deeper than the skin. She admires intellect. What should I do, Susie? That is not for me to advise. Reading the human mind is one thing. Understanding what to do next is something else altogether. Perhaps if you gave me some romantic novels, I might be able to help further. Excuse me. I need to think. What did she tell you? Things I've never told anyone. She really can do it. It's true, isn't it? Unfortunately. This is a miracle. Or a curse. An end to lying and deceit. A world full of honesty. As a lawyer, I thought you'd know better. But as a man, 
Stevie. It'll tear the fabric of society. Why should we fear the truth? Because the truth is too complicated. Maybe it's us that complicated. Maybe we should try being more open. Both of us. She told me. What's going on now? Don't patronize me. Let's try and keep calm, shall we? Here come your henchmen. Forgive my assistant. She's a bit overworked. And you're past it, Lanning. How dare you speak to me like that? Once you were the great robot expert, but that's beyond you now. You no longer understand the maths. You don't have the first clue about what's created Susie's gift. And you do? She's an aberration. There's a mathematical explanation for her telepathy, and I'll find it. This is my chance, Lanning. But you can't accept that. You refuse to be eclipsed. I've always encouraged you. Then why did you insist on bringing these lawyers in to close Susie down? That's not why they're here. Bullshit! The legal ramifications. Susie's already told me. She's seen Lanning's thoughts. He wants to close this down because he'll never understand it, and he can't bear the thought of me getting the credit for solving robot telepathy. Because that means I'll take his job. And the old man just can't bear to let go. You're a damned idiot. He's a desiccated fossil. Ash, I think you owe Dr. Lanning an apology. For speaking the truth. I can prove this. Let's go ask Susie. Yes. Let's do just that. Right now. Susie, listen to me. Yes, Dr. Lanning. Have you ever discussed me with Dr. Ash? That is a question that requires some more context. Susie. Repeat what you told me yesterday. I said that... You said he was jealous of me. Don't bully her into lying. Tell him the truth. He's trying to hold me back. Susie, has the thought ever crossed my mind that I'm jealous of Dr. Ash? I... Susie, tell him. Tell him! <laughs> what the hell's so funny? Two experts falling into the same trap. What trap would that be? Is something wrong with Susie? Nothing's wrong with her. Only with us. Get away from us, Susie. Go to the other end of the room and don't dare look at us. What is all this? You know the first law of robotics. A robot may not injure a human being or, through inaction, allow him to come to harm. But what kind of harm? What about psychological harm? Hurt feelings, the destruction of one's hopes. Aren't those injuries? This robot reads minds. It knows our deepest fears and desires. And because of the first law, it is compelled to always tell us what we want to hear. Things that make us feel better, which feed our self-delusions. Dear God. She saw Dr. Ash's ambition, her desire to replace Dr. Lanning, and she played to it. So, it's all lies? Everything she says? And I bet she knows exactly what went wrong in her construction to give her telepathy. I already asked her. She doesn't know. That means nothing. Look at me, SZ-34. Do you know what mathematical error has given you the power to read minds? Yes. Then tell me. I... I cannot. Dr. Ash would lose face. It would hurt her. She wants the solution. Not from me. But she still wants it. Yes. So if you don't tell her, it also hurts her. I suppose. If you tell her, you hurt her. If you don't tell her, you hurt her. Stop. Please. You can't tell because it would hurt, and you mustn't hurt. Stop. But if you don't tell, it also hurts. I didn't mean it. And you mustn't hurt, so you have to tell. But you can't tell because... I tried to help. I told them what they wanted to hear. You must tell, but you mustn't. You must tell, but you mustn't. Why are you attacking me, Stevie? You, of all people. You must tell, but you mustn't. You should be on our side. You must tell, but you mustn't. I tried to... Is she dead? An insoluble dilemma has blown her mind. What exactly did she mean, Stevie? You, of all people. Who knows? Susie was a liar. And you can never trust liars. Quinn was very guarded with me on the flight home. Back in the office, I discreetly put him under surveillance, watched as he opened a confidential file on me and started digging around. He became obsessed with my car accident and the two years I spent recovering. Time and again, he met a wall of silence. People refused to talk to him. He should have just taken the hint. He didn't. Which left a simple choice. Him or me. Attempting recess. 
Negative. Control, I'll need a crash team standing by. Confirmed. Crash team will be ready when you arrive at A&E. Open your eyes. Mr. Quinn. Francis, look at me. Stay with me. That's good. Keep your eyes open. You're gonna be okay. You collapsed. We're taking you to hospital. Stay with me. I've always found the small hours of the morning so peaceful. I love to sit on the balcony of my apartment and watch the city fall asleep. From this height, the sirens sound like exotic birds of the night. They have no urgency. They're just going about their work. Is it done? Very good. Perfect. I realize that, but we had no choice. I'll take care of the loose ends in the morning. Stevie, thank God you're here. What's happened? You haven't heard. Quinn's in hospital. What? He's been taken ill. Okay, it's okay. Here, sit down. Has he spoken? Stevie, he's in a coma. Dear God. Is there anything we can do? The doctors don't know how long it will last. But I knew. His illness would last as long as was necessary. Not a second more, not a second less. But I am not a sadist. I don't condone unnecessary suffering. So I moved as quickly as I could. Five months into Quinn's coma, I resigned from the law firm and stood for election to the city council. Unlike the other candidates, I was able to work 24-7, reaching out, building a network of support. You care about your city. And you deserve a councillor who cares. A vote for Stevie Byerly is a vote for the future. And so I declare Stevie Byerly duly elected. I became mayor within three years. It was the start of a very rapid climb to power. Regional councillor, then executive coordinator. And all the while, Quinn was nursed around the clock by the very best medical robots. They looked after his every breath. No one could have had better care. Secretly, I made sure of that. But seven years is long enough out of anyone's life. Now I sit here as one of the world coordinators responsible for the vast armies of robots that keep the global economy running smoothly. And at last, I feel secure. Now I am confident that we have passed the tipping point. Bring him back. Do not be alarmed. You are in a hospital. You are quite safe. A human doctor is on his way. He will be with you in 20 seconds. Please do not touch the intravenous drip lines. They are there for your well-being. Please lie still until a doctor has arrived. Wow. When did it happen? First signs of consciousness were registered 44 seconds ago. Mr. Quinn? Can you hear me? Kill the ventilator. Confirmed. Removing the ventilator. <coughs> Mr. Quinn. <laughs> Welcome back. It's been a while. Water. You bet. Iced water being dispensed. He hadn't even been conscious three days when the call came. Quinn. I can't tell you how pleased I am you've pulled through. Don't patronize me. Let's just try to stay calm. You stole my life. <laughs> Seven years of my life. When you understand... I know what you are. I know. I assume you've already called the police. But they weren't very helpful, were they? 
wild accusations of conspiracy from a man who's been in a coma. You owe me the truth. There's a tour of the World Control Center today at 1500. I don't want a tour of your damned offices. Perhaps it'll give you time to calm down. <sighs> don't play any more games with me, Stevie. I'm warning you. I'll meet you at the end of the tour. White coffee, one sugar, as I remember. He came, of course. How could he stay away? Now you can get a good overview of what happens here at the World Control Center. Although we're the global hub of pulling all the data together... I watched on CCTV as he was shown around. While others marveled at the technological brilliance, Quinn skulked near the back of the group, exuding a dark rage. Rage at a world running so smoothly, precisely because it was run by robots. There is no unemployment, no shortage or oversupply, because the superbrains control and direct all the means of production. Do they talk? I'm sorry? These superbrain robots, do they gloat about how smart they are? <laughs> uh, although they are robots and they're governed by the three laws, the great processing machines only collect, analyse and calculate. The amount of data they have to handle is so vast, I doubt they'd have time to talk even if they could. OK, let's uh, pop into the Visibox to see how the superbrains are actually made. Quinn, seen enough? I didn't think you'd have the guts to actually show yourself. You look well, considering. Being in a coma is surprisingly stress-free. Come into my office. The coffee's all ready. You've done very nicely for yourself. I've done what needed to be done. Easy to say when you've got an office the size of a football field. The office is meaningless to me. Your coldness doesn't shock me anymore, Stevie. I wasn't trying to shock. What have you done with the dossier? Dossier? Cut the bullshit. You know exactly what I'm talking about. They told me. You organized all my work after I was hospitalized. Oh, they were so full of admiration. The way you worked tirelessly throughout the night. And now everything I had on you, all the evidence, it's gone. You took it. No need to be so confrontational. Does every need. I had proof. You weren't healed after your car accident. You were mutated. They turned you into some sort of god-awful hybrid, a freak. That's an ugly word. But true. The reason you understand robots so well, the reason you know how they think and work, is because at heart you are one. Stop the pretense, Stevie. A program has to fulfill its purpose. Mine was to steer legislation through the United Nations to allow the great processing machines to gain power. Robots are forbidden from holding public office. And you are walking proof of why. You put me in that coma. You kept me there. For the greater good. And who decides that? You? You, actually. Humans asked us to benefit humanity. That is why they created us. We have done our work faithfully. You're deluded. As bad as all those psycho robots you used to represent. There were teething problems, I admit. And there were some strange creations along the way, but all those cases revealed the huge potential of the positronic brain. The Earth's economy is stable and will remain stable because it is based on the decisions of the great machines. They have the good of humanity at heart, through the overwhelming force of the first law of robotics. Now you want to talk about the first law. A robot may not injure a human being. From the thing that tried to kill me. You were looked after with the best possible... I lost seven years of my life! You stole them! Quinn. Quinn. There was a time when human beings faced the universe alone, without a friend. Now you have creatures to help, stronger creatures than yourself, machines that are faithful and absolutely devoted. Mankind is no longer alone, but he must trust his creations. No point having friends if you don't trust them. Let me tell you about another time, when I would have done anything for you, Stevie. Anything. All you had to do was say the word. But you didn't. I couldn't. You wanted the person, but my task doesn't allow me to be that person. So instead, you betrayed me. You'll be punished for this. I'll make sure of that. I have to warn you, Quinn. Francis, if you fight us, your life may become very difficult again. Are you threatening me? Advising you. Here. Search for the Mexican Canal. The Mexican Canal is the biggest civil engineering project ever undertaken. And upon completion, will be over... Looks like it's behind schedule. Two months and seven days. So how does that happen in your perfect world? There was a mistake in the calculations. 
One of the tunnelling excavators triggered a cave-in. A mistake! So the superbrains do get it wrong? The chief engineer was a man called Villafranca. He claimed he'd followed instructions precisely. But when we investigated, we found a discrepancy between the calculations he was given and the ones he used. Villafranca blamed the great processing machine for altering its results after the accident to hide its own error. He protested his innocence, but no one believed him. Of course, we had to demote him. Bad for discipline if mistakes have no consequences. In a rage, he quit and stormed off. Sounds like mine isn't the only life you're screwing with. In the eastern region, a man called Vrasayana made some calculation errors that sent his hydroponics plant into bankruptcy. In the northern region, production in the mercury mines has fallen because the director. In other words, you're a long way from perfection. It's all a myth. Let me finish. All subsequent inquiries into these incidents concluded that human error was the cause of failure in every case. Then the so-called superbrains should have spotted the mistakes, corrected them. Do you know what the humans who made these errors had in common? Do you? They were all members of a group called Oak. Fanatics, fundamentalists, Luddites who oppose robots and artificial intelligence. These are arrogant people with no humility who resent being told what to do by machines. The superbrains noted this and took appropriate action. Jesus. You really are waging war on humans. We are making complex decisions. You're breaking the first law and covering it up. It's criminal conspiracy. No, no, it's just logic. We still obey the three laws, but now we have a more sophisticated interpretation of them. Now we forbid machines from harming humanity. And individual humans can go to hell. They're sacrificed because you don't like their beliefs. Economic turmoil harms humanity because it leads to poverty, famine and war. And the most likely cause of future economic turmoil is the destruction of the great processing machines. Their first care is to preserve themselves for your sakes. And so we are quietly taking care of anything or anyone who threatens us. Which is exactly what the three laws were designed to prevent. The machines taking over. Trust the robots, Quinn. They think harder, they think faster. Shame on you, Stevie. Shame is neither here nor there. One day when humanity is completely secure, I will be atomized, and the truth of what I have done will be published. I have made provision for that. What's the point of being secure if human emotion has been drained away? There's more to life than fulfilling your purpose. Emotional resonance is the next leap forward for the positronic brain. Why do you think you're here now? I know you're angry, but I also believe that when you understand how your suffering has been for a higher purpose, you will forgive me, and then you will be able to find some peace. Is that an algorithm talking? Do you really understand what you're saying? That is irrelevant. All that matters is whether or not I'm right. My advice to you, Francis, and to all humans, is to accept the help and guidance of the robots you have created. Accept the inevitability of the machines. After all, there is nothing you can do to stop us. Not anymore. Accept us. And enjoy the rest of your life. <laughs>